Hey everyone, how's it going? So uh, before we move on, I just want to do one more example of uh, finding a limit numerically, because this this might have come up in the homework, um, and I'm not quite sure I addressed this in the last video. So suppose we have a table, right? And we make a table and we have these x's on the left and then the corresponding y's on the right. And then the question is, what is the limit as x approaches 2 of this function? And again, I didn't tell you what the function is, uh, but in this case it doesn't matter, right? So what, what, what could we say the limit is here? Well, as you approach 2, right, so um, eventually what I'll do is, is I'll draw the graph here. Right, so this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 for x, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 for y. Um, and we don't need the, the negatives here, I don't think. Uh, well, we might need them for y eventually. Um, so, so just looking at, the, before I do the graph, right, let's look at the table here, right? What's happening as x is approaching 2? Uh, from the left side, right? In other words, when x is less than 2, right? Um, so when x is less than 2, we're, we're down here, right? At 1.9 is less than 2, and y would be 4.8, right? And then when x is 1.99, y is 4.98, and so on. And so you might say, well, look, we're getting very close to 2 here, right? And these numbers to my eye, they look like they're getting close to 5. And so you might conclude that the limit has to be 5, right? But hang on, right? Remember, when we find the limit, we have to look on both sides. We have to look both to the left and to the right, right? So coming from the right side, when x is bigger than 2, these are these numbers here, right? 2.1. 2.01, 2.001. These are bigger than 2, right? Here, x is bigger than 2. Um, so what's happening from the right side? Well, right, as x is getting closer and closer to 2, the y values look like they're getting closer to 3. Uh-huh. So that's a problem because we, th we thought it was 5 coming from the left side. And then coming from the right side, we can say that this is 5 or 3. Well, which is it? Right? Is it 5? Is it 3? Right? Can it be both? Well, right, if you think about it for a second, it, it can't be both because the whole idea of a function, right? y is a function of x. If I plug in a number for x, say 7, right? Um, I'm not going to get y equals negative 12 or 4, right? You, you cannot get two different y values for the same x value. That defeats the whole purpose of a function, right? So that can't happen. And so the same is true for limits, right? For limits, you can't have more than one answer here, right? So, so we can say it's either 5 or 3, but not both. And, right, so, so obviously it depends on which side you're looking at. If you're looking from the left side, um, it looks like it's approaching 5. And if you look from the right side, it looks like it's approaching 3. And so we simply have to give up, right? We simply have to say, nope, it's not 5, it's not 3, right? That this limit just does, does not exist. Okay, so that would be the answer here, right? And now we can look at the graph. Um, so I believe the graph will look something like this. Um, so it's going to be 1 here, 3 here, and then 5. So this is going to be more or less a straight line that just stops right here at 2 and just keeps going to the left. And then... From the right, I think it looks something like this. 
So you probably recognize this as a piecewise defined function or just piecewise function, right? So it's two different pieces, right? And so now looking at the graph, right, again, let's look from the right side. From the right side, the y values seem to be getting closer to 3, right? You ne they never make it to 3, but remember, the limit doesn't care what happens when x equals 2. It only cares what happens when it's close to 2, right? Say 2.5 or 2.1 or 2.01. Right, so then the, y, the corresponding y values here get close to y equals 3. Okay, so that's only coming from the right. right. So now if we come from the left, when x is less than 2, you can see what happens, right? When you plug in these numbers, 1.9, 1.99, and so on, the y values get closer to 5. Right, so here's y equals 5. Right. And in fact, they do make it to 5. So if you did plug in 2 here, you would actually get 5, although that's, you know, that's only clear from the graph. It's not clear from the table. Right. So, yeah, so this function, in, in retrospect, is the function 2x plus 1 um, if x is less than 2. Uh, yeah, I should say less than or equal to 2. And it's, it's 5 minus x if x is bigger than 2. So that's, that, that, that was the actual example that I was looking at, but we didn't even need to know that. All we needed was this information in the table here or this information in the graph to be able to tell that the limit as x approaches 2 does not exist. And it does not exist because it can't approach more than one value. Right, if it approaches two different values, right, from the left and from the right, we just, we just give up and we say there is no limit there. It has to be the same from both sides, both left and right. Okay, so that's, that's important. And I think I, I might have mentioned that last time, but I, I might not have emphasized that enough. So I hope, I hope that helps. Um, so what we're going to see later, just as a, a little bit of a preview, though, is we can define just left and right-handed limits. So it's called the left-handed limit. Looks like this. It's, we're going to say we want the limit as x approaches 2, but only from the left side. In other words, from the negative side, right, when x is less than 2. So that little minus sign here means, right, from the left. Okay. And yeah, so we want the limit of the, the function, f of x. And so the left-handed limit, if we only care about what happens when x is less than 2, then on the table we're only looking at these numbers here. So when x is less than 2, the y values seem to be getting close to 5. Okay, so it does have a left-handed limit. Likewise, you can define the right-handed limit. The limit from the right. So this is coming, approaching to, x is approaching 2, but from the positive side, from the, from the right side, right? When x is bigger than 2. So this little positive sign means we're coming from the right side, from the positive side of 2. Okay, so we're taking the limit of the same function, f of x, although a different piece of it, right? This piece, 5 minus x, and the y values are approaching 3. Right? You can see that from the graph, right? Over here, the y values are approaching 3. And you can, you can see that from the table. If you only consider when x is greater than 2, that's from the right side of 2, then the y, the y values here are approaching 3. Okay, so you can have a left-handed limit, a left-handed limit, sorry, and a right-handed limit, but in this case they're not the same. They're not equal. And when the right-handed limit and the left-handed limit are not equal, when they don't match, then 
when you take the limit as x approaches 2, and this means from both sides, then that limit cannot exist, as we said earlier, right? So yes, if you don't see, right, a plus sign here or a minus sign here, then it means from both sides, right? So this is from both right and left. And it has to be the same for both. Okay, so I hope that helps uh, at least explain that because I know in the homework some of the, some of the functions were given as graphs, some of them you had to write the tables, and I just want to make it clear that the left-handed limit and the right-handed limit both have to be the same for the limit to exist, right? Okay, and in some sense that was, you know, th this was this was not true for when we had the vertical asymptote, right? When we had the vertical asymptotes, um, I think it was approaching negative infinity from the left and positive infinity from the right. And because positive infinity and negative infinity are two different, two different things, again, two different, I don't want to call them numbers, but two different ideas. Um, so we, we gave up there too, and we said that the limit, I think as x approaches negative one, did not exist. And later on, we'll see that in some cases, you can have a vertical asymptote that looks like this. Let's say it's at x equals 3. And the graph might look like this. Right. So in this case, from both sides, both from the left and from the right, they both approach positive infinity. Right. So if this is x equals 3, we can say that the limit as x approaches 3 of this function, whatever it is, uh, maybe I should call it g of x because it's a different function than the one we had earlier. But whatever function this is, right, so this is the graph of g of x, that we can say that this limit does not exist, but specifically it's because it's positive infinity. But that's just a more specific way to say that the limit does not exist. Remember, infinity is not a number. So yeah, you can say that the limit is positive infinity, or if it went this way, downward, you can say it's negative infinity, but that doesn't mean that the limit exists, right? It's, it, it's still, it's not a number, right? right? For the limit to exist, it has to be a number, like five or three or 1.8 or, or pi squared, but not infinity or negative infinity, right? So, so again, this is something we'll see later. These are infinite limits. Okay, so I think that's enough for graphs and, and tables numerically. Now we want to get to finding limits um, algebraically. Right, so that's the topic of the next section. Finding limits. Uh, I'll say either analytically or algebraically. I spelled that right. Finding, finding limits. Right. And in order to do this, uh, we need a bunch of rules. Um, and we're going to have a list of um, probably quite a few rules here, and it might seem a little overwhelming, um, but we're, we're kind of building them up slowly. In the end, uh, there's only going to be just a few handful of rules, and most of them, I think, are going to be in fairly intuitive at that point. Um, but we want to start slowly, so we're going to start with just a, a whole bunch of rules uh, that will help us to find limits later. Okay, And these rules basically just tell us what, what limits are in very specific cases. Okay, So let, let's start with... Um, the first theorem here. So a theorem is just a mathematical statement that, that can be proven. Um, we're not going to prove most of these. So these are just basic limits, right? These are properties, basic properties of limits here. Um, so we're going to let b and c be real numbers. Right? So any real numbers. And we're going to let n 
uh, be a positive integer. Right, so one, two, three, four, and so on, right? Counting numbers, right? Okay, so the first rule we're gonna have says this. If we take the limit as x approaches c of the number b, then the answer is b, right? So b is just any number, right? So, so here's an example of that. Uh, suppose we want to take the limit as x approaches 0 of negative 7. So think about what we're saying here. x is getting close to 0. What's happening with negative 7? Well, it's it's negative 7, right? It doesn't matter what x is doing. Negative 7 is always negative 7. It's a constant, right? So that, that's the b in this case. b is negative 7 and c is 0, right? So for any constant, right, the limit is just that constant, right? I, I hope that seems reasonable. Um, I mean, after all, just, just look at the graph here. So here's... Uh, Right, so here's the x-axis, here's the y-axis. We've got to go down a bit. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So the graph is just a horizontal line, right? y equals negative 7. And x is approaching 0, right? So here's, you know, here's 1, here's negative 1. Right? 0 is right in the middle. So what's happening to y when x is approaching 0 well, the y values are approaching negative 7. In fact, they are negative 7, right? If you make a table, you can do that, right? So what numbers are approaching 0? Well, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, and so on, right? And then from the negative side, you have negative 0.001. Uh, put that a little bit longer here, right? And what's y going to be? Uh, well, y is going to be negative 7. Right? It doesn't matter what x is. So based on that, as x is getting close to 0, y should be getting close to negative 7. In fact, if you plug in 0 into the function, you get negative 7. Oops. So, yeah. so f of x is just a very boring function. It's a constant function. So when you plug in 0, you get negative 7. But that's different from saying that the limit as x approaches 0 uh, is negative 7, right? So for example, we, we could say that if you plug in 0 here, you don't get negative 7. Let's say you only get um, negative 2, right? So let's change that to negative 2. So what that means is on the graph, we would remove this point here and then move it up to right about here, negative 2, 0, negative 2. And that leaves a hole at x equals 0, y equals negative 7. Right? So this is now a hole in the graph. So the limit is still approaching negative 7, even though the y-coordinate, the value of the function here, is negative 2. Okay. So, so, yeah. so make sure you understand that the, the, the value of the function, the y-coordinate, has nothing to do with the limit. If they are equal, that's okay. But in this case, they don't have to be equal. Right? Okay, anyways, moving on to some, some more rules here. So again, it's, just keep this in mind. This is a, again, when you think about it, should be a, a pretty obvious rule here. Um, but there's, there's going to be others. Uh, the second one just says that if I take the limit as x approaches c of the function x, right? so f of x equals x, this is sometimes called the identity function, uh, so what do you think the limit is? Well, so the question is, what's happening with x? As x is approaching c, x is approaching, I just said it, 
it's approaching C. So the limit as x approaches C of x is C. Right? It's, so nothing deep going on here, right? X is approaching C, so X is approaching C. Okay? You can make a table, you can make a graph, um, but I'm going to leave it at that and just say that it's, 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 it, it's, it's, it's pretty clear on its own, I think. Okay, and then there's one related to this, maybe not quite as obvious. So here, X is approaching C again, but now the function is not x anymore, it's x to the n. Right? And remember, n is just a positive integer, so this could be x squared, it could be x cubed, right? it could be x to the fourth power, right? but it could be any positive integer. Well, uh, you're, you're, you, know, you would probably guess that this would be just be c to the power n, and you would be right. So, for example, here, if we have the limit as x is approaching, let's do negative 3, and this was x squared, well, according to this rule, right, here, c is negative 3, right, n is 2, so c to the n would be negative 3 to the power 2, which is what? Right, so negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. Right? It's not negative 9, right? It's not, it's, yeah. So make sure you understand the difference between negative 3 squared and negative 3 squared. Right? One's positive, one is negative. Right? So here you're taking this negative 3 and you're squaring it. So negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. Okay? So that's it. That's the first property here, the first theorem. Just these three rules. The limit of a constant is just that constant. The limit of x as x approaches c is c. And the limit of x to the n as x approaches c is just c to the n. Okay? All right. Um, next rule. And I'm running out of space, so let's start over here. Okay. So this will be theorem 1.2, and again, I'm just, I'm just labeling these as they are in the book, um, but it doesn't matter what we call it, right? So these are more properties of, of limits. Okay. Right, so the setup is the same. B and C are real numbers. Um, right, N is a positive integer. positive integer. And uh, even though we don't need them, I'm going to use L and K. So L and K are also uh, real numbers. Right. So the first part of this theorem says the following. If I want to take the limit as x approaches c of some number b times some function f, I'll call it f of x. Um, oh, I, I'm skipping something here, but okay, I'll come back to it. Uh, so the limit of a number times a function turns out that you can just take that number b and then multiply by the limit of that function. Okay, so yeah, the, the one thing I skipped here is two conditions here. If I take the limit as x approaches c of f of x, that limit is L. And if I take the limit as x approaches c of the function g of x, that that limit is k. So we don't really need that here because we can, we can equally say here that this is just b times L. That's how the book writes it. So the limit of a constant times a function is the constant times the limit. In other words, this, this b here right, can come outside the limit because it's just a number, and then just multiply the limit. OK? All right. Uh, second one. 
says what happens when we add or subtract two functions. Right? So we want to take the limit. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. We want to take the limit. X is approaching C of the following function. It's going to be f of x plus g of x. So we're taking the limit of the sum of two functions. Well, you may not believe this, but it turns out that you can just as well add the two limits. So take the limit as x approaches c of f of x, and the limit as x approaches c of g of x, and then just add those two limits together. In other words, this will just be L plus K. Okay. So we think of this as like a sum rule for limits. The limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. Okay. Maybe let's just write that down. Right? That's the way to remember this. The limit of a sum is equal to the sum of the two limits. So yes, very useful. Um, in fact, let's, let's look at a quick example here. Suppose I want to find the limit as x approaches 2 of, let's say the function is x squared plus x. Right. So we can think of the x squared as your f of x and your g of x is just x. Okay. Well, according to this rule here, I can just take the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x, that's x squared, plus the limit as x approaches 2 of just x. Right? And what are these limits? So what's the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared? Well, that co oh, I erased it already, but that comes back to the c to the n, right? So c is 2 and n is 2, so this is just going to be 2 squared, right? And this was also the previous rule, x approaches 2, so x approaches 2. So we just get 2 squared, which is 4, and 4 plus 2 is 6. So our, our final answer here is 6. Right. So that's the limit, just to remind you, that's the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared plus x. And now you might be thinking, wait a minute, what, I, I, that's, that's easy, right? Well, why didn't you just take 2 squared plus 2, right? In other words, just replace these x's here with 2. Well... It turns out that you can do that here, but remember, that's not how to find a limit. So I want to constantly remind you that while it seems to work in this case, that you can just plug in 2, right, wherever you see an x, that's not the idea of a limit, right? The idea of a limit is what happens to this, what happens to x squared plus x as x gets close to 2, okay? So... Yeah, so in this case, yes, you can plug in 2, but we've seen a lot of examples already where you're not allowed to plug in 2. Um, it doesn't give you the limit, right? It might give you the wrong answer, or it just might give you an answer that may, may may, maybe that it does not exist, even though it does. Or it, it, it might not have a limit, even though you, when you plug it in, it looks like you get a limit. Either way... Right. You don't find the limit by plugging in the numbers, right, in general. It, it happens to work here, but it doesn't always work, right? So, yes. So, doing this process of using these, using these rules here, as we did over here, to find the limit, um, it just takes some getting used to, right? It just takes getting used to these rules. Um, but once you do this, right, at least you don't have to make a table anymore, Right. Remember doing all this, right? plugging in numbers close to 2, right? 1.9, 1.99. Remember how, how clumsy that was? So, so this way is, I think, much easier and much slicker.
than having to make a table or a graph. Okay. All right, let's go on to the next rule. Um, this is part three of the same theorem here. And so, oh, before I do that, um, there's actually a separate rule here for the sum or difference. So you can think of this as the sum rule or the difference rule. So it doesn't matter whether you're adding or subtracting. So this could be f of x minus g of x, and then you would just subtract the two limits. So really, it's for adding or subtracting um, that you can, you can use this rule here. Right? Right. What happens if you're multiplying? Right? So that's a separate question. The question now is, if I'm going to take the limits as x approaches c of f of x times g of x, what do we get? Right? Can we just multiply the two limits? Can I take the limit of f of x and multiply by the limit, that's supposed to be a times, right? of g of x. Right. And if it helps, I can enclose them in brackets or parentheses. Right. So according to this property, the answer is yes, we could do that. Right. Um, and it's, it's not really easy to find a good example of this, um, at least not yet. But let's, let's suppose x is approaching 5, and f of x is, let's just say, x squared and g of x is x cubed. So according to this property, I can take the limit as x approaches 5 of x squared, and then times the limit as x approaches 5 of x cubed. Well, right, this is the same exponential rule, right? This is going to be 5 to the 2 times 5 to the 3. Again, how, how was I able to, to do this? That comes from the rule that uh, I already erased, but it was the first theorem, right? x approaches c of x to the n is just c to the n. So here my c is 5, and here my n is 2, here my n is 3. Right, so different n's, but the same c for both. c is 5, right? So to finish this, 5 squared is 25, and this is going to be times 125. And I have to get out my calculator for that. This is going to be 3,125. So pretty big number, but that's the answer here. Okay, so that's how the product rule works here. Right? So th this is think of this as the product rule for limits. Not for derivatives yet. We're not, we're not there yet. This is just for limits, OK? Right. Um, now, in retrospect, the, even this was a kind of clumsy way to do it. The easiest way to do this, of course, is to simplify what's inside the brackets here. x squared times x cubed is x to the power be careful, it's not 6, right? You don't multiply 2 times 3, it's 2 plus 3, which is 5. And now I can use the same rule over here with n is equal to 5. c is 5 and n is 5, so this is just 5 to the 5, which again is 3125. So we got the same answer. I would say this is a little bit easier than doing it this way, but, um, but you get the same answer. Okay. Uh, so we did adding, subtracting, multiplying, and of course now we do dividing. So that's the fourth part. You want to take the limit as x approaches c of a quotient of two functions. We'll say f of x divided by g of x. And at this point, it should not come as a surprise that you can just divide the two limits. You can take the limit of f and the limit of g and then just divide the two limits. Okay. In other words, this is going to be L divided by K. Oh, and I didn't mention here that this is L times K. Way up in the upper right here? Okay. Um, 
Yes. So it's also true for, for division. However, there's one important uh, condition here that you have to be careful of because this comes up a lot. Um, this is a fraction, right? L divided by K. L and K are just numbers. And whenever you divide, well, you better make sure that you're not dividing by zero. So this is only going to work if k is not equal to zero. In other words, if the limit of, in the denominator here right, has to be non-zero. It can be any other number, but not zero. Just not zero. OK. OK. So that's, uh, that's the fourth rule here. There's one more. One more part to this, and we're going to take the limit as x approaches c of the function f of x, but we're going to take the whole function raised to the power n. So it's not just x to the n anymore, it's f of x to the, to the nth power. Okay, so, right, so as it happens, if you can just take the limit and raise that to the nth power. So take the limit as x approaches c of f of x. Again, we don't know what that is, but we just, whatever the number that is, we just raise it to the power n. Right, so it's just l to the n. Okay. So, yep. So these are the, again, these are all in the book, these, these five parts here. Right? Um, so, again, it's, it's already a lot of rules. However, uh, there's a nice summary here. The next property, which is theorem 1.3, kind of summarizes all this. Theorem 1.3. Um, so we're going to let p of x and q of x be polynomial functions. I hope you know what those are by now. These are just polynomials. OK. So. The first part just says that if I want to take the limit as x approaches c of the polynomial p of x, that I can find this limit by replacing x with c. Okay. So as long as you're dealing with polynomials, you can find the limit by plugging in c. Right? And I know. It wasn't that long ago when I just warned you against that. I warned you that, hey, you don't find limits by plugging in this number here. Well, in some cases you can, and in this case we can. Right? So here's a good example of that. Suppose um, x is approaching, let's just do negative 1. And the polynomial, so what's a polynomial? How about 2x cubed minus 5x squared um, plus 3x minus 11. Okay, so this is a cubic function, cubic polynomial. Um, and it is a polynomial, right? So in other words, this is my p of x. Right. Well, um, so let's just use the rule. The rule says that we can evaluate this, this limit just by replacing all the x's with negative 1. So this is going to be negative, well, 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. Negative 5 times positive 1 is negative 5. 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. And then minus 11. So this is, let's see, negative 21, I think. Negative 7, negative 10, negative 21. Yep. So the answer is negative 21. Right. right. Contrast that with making a table or drawing the graph. Either way, that takes a lot more work than doing this. OK? So, so yeah, I know it wasn't that long ago when I warned you, hey, right, you, don't, you can't find the limit by plugging in the negative 1. Right? In general, no, you can't. But when you're dealing with a polynomial function, then you can. So for other types of functions, this won't work, right? If you're not dealing with polynomials, then this is not guaranteed to work. You cannot 
always plug in the number. But for polynomials, which is a lot of different types of functions that, right, that we deal with, um, then it does work. Right? So this question mark here is fine, and that's because this function here, this p of x, is a polynomial. And that's the only reason why this works here. Okay? So that's part one. Part two is even better. So now we're going to take the limit as x approaches c of a polynomial divided by another polynomial. Right? So this, this is a different class of functions. These are called rational functions. Right? And in fact, any, right, any polynomial is automatically a rational function. Right? You're just dividing by 1. And q of x is, well, it's a polynomial. It's just 1. Um, but of course, you have rational functions that are not polynomials either. Right? Right. So, right, same thing here. We can evaluate this limit by plugging in c. However, one very important condition here, this is if, big if here, q of c does not equal 0. So as long as the denominator here is not 0, then you can evaluate the limit by plugging in the number. Okay, so I think, I think an example is in order here. Let's look at an example here. Suppose we want to find the limit and hang on to the x approaches. I'm just going to write down the function. How about 2x divided by x squared minus x? Okay, so this is a polynomial, uh, sorry, this is a rational function. It's a polynomial over a polynomial, a linear function divided by a quadratic function, right? All right, so x is approaching 3. x is approaching 3. Right, so how can I find this limit? Well, the easiest way, right, rather than make a table or a graph, which you can do, of course, but the easiest way is to use this property up here, use, use rule 2 here, which says that I can evaluate this limit by just replacing x with 3. This is 3 squared minus 3. So the numerator is 2 times 3 is 6. The denominator is, let's see, 3 squared is 9, and 9 minus 3 is also 6. And look at that, 6 divided by 6 is 1, so the answer is 1. Right. So yeah, that, that's, that's the answer. And again, the, the, this works because this is a rational function. It might not work for other types of functions, but it does work specifically for polynomials and rational functions. Okay, right. so let's, let's do another example using the same function here. Okay. Let's find the limit as x approaches 0 of 2x divided by x squared minus x. Okay, well, let's see. Can we do it the same way we did this? Let's try it. 2 times 0 divided by 0 squared minus 0. So the numerator, 2 times 0 is 0, and then 0 squared is 0, and 0 minus 0 is also 0. So we get 0 divided by 0. Is that the answer? What is that? What's 0 divided by 0? Right. Nonsense. It's nothing. It's undefined. Right? So that, can't, that, that cannot be the answer. This is wrong. Okay. So the answer here is no. We cannot evaluate this limit right, um, of this function by using this rule. Right. You see the issue? The denominator here is 0. And this condition very clearly says that this denominator better not be 0. If it is, then it doesn't give you an answer. So we're still left with the question then, right, what is the limit here? Right, if it's not, well, if it's not 0 divided by 0, what is it? Okay. Um, and so hang on to that. I think we'll come back to this, or I'll try to come back to this if I remember to, to do that. Um, so it's a good example, but again, you have to be careful in using this rule here. This condition here is very important. This comes up 
a lot more than you would think. Right? It didn't happen for the for this example because six right six was not equal to zero, so there's no issue here. This is the correct answer for for this limit as x approaches three. But yes, as x approaches zero, it doesn't work. Right? And by the way, it would also right same thing would happen um, if you're approaching one. So as x is approaching one of the same function, 2x over x squared minus x, you see what happens. You get 2 times 1 in the numerator divided by 1 squared minus 1. So you get 2 divided by 0. Um, again, whenever you get 0 in the denominator, that's bad. Right? So this would be undefined. But again, that doesn't, that doesn't give us the answer. That doesn't tell us what the limit is. Right? All we know is that the limit is not undefined. It's not 2 divided by 0. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so I guess I'm out of space. I'm going to st start over, and we'll continue with more properties in just a second. Okay, so the next property. This is theorem 1.4 in the book. n is a positive integer, and the limits as x approaches c of the nth root of x is the nth root of c. But again, this comes with a very important condition here, so let's look at this carefully. This is going to be true if n is either odd or if n is even and c is positive. Okay, so if n is odd, it doesn't matter whether c is positive or negative. But if n is even, then c better be positive. Okay, so some examples. Suppose we want to take the limit. Um, as x approaches, let's do 8, of the cube root of x. Okay, so here n is 3. And by the way, 3 is an odd number. I hope, hope you know that. Um, and c is 8. c is positive, but it doesn't matter. Right? So this is going to be the cube root of 8, which is also 2. Okay. So... Yeah, it doesn't matter whether c is positive or negative here. If c is negative 8, and we have the same cube root of x, well, right, n is 3, n is odd. So this is still the cube root of negative 8, which is negative 2. Okay, what happens if n is even, right? So an even would be, say, a square root. Oh, we could, let's do a fourth root. How about x is approaching 16? of the fourth root of x. Right? So according to this rule, this would be the fourth root of 16, and that's because right, 16 is positive, right? and the fourth root of 16 is 2. Again, we get a lot of 2's here. Right? Okay. So let's do, let's do an example of a square root. Suppose we take the limit as x approaches 9 of the square root of x. Okay, so here n is 2. We usually don't put the 2 here for the square root um, because it's just understood to be a 2, right? But the answer, as you would expect, is the square root of 9, which is 3. Okay. So the issue comes up now. What happens if x is approaching negative 9 of the square root of x? Well... This is the this is the important exception here, right? So n is right, n is two, which is even, but c is negative nine, which is not positive, right? C is not greater than zero. And so we cannot use this rule to find the answer. But you can probably guess what the answer is, right? Um, if you were to take the square root of negative nine, you would get an imaginary number, 3i. And we, we tend to ignore those in this class. Right? So, so because it's not a real number, we just say that this limit does not exist. Right? In other words, negative 9 is not in the domain of the function. Should, sorry, for being a little sloppy here. So negative 9 is not in the domain of the square root function. Right. So if remember, anytime you take the square root of x, it's assumed that x is greater than or equal to 0. 
That's the domain of this function. Okay. Uh, one more, actually. This is kind of an important one. What's the limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of x? Let me erase this 16 here. Square root of 0. Okay. So your instinct might tell you, well, look. I can take the square root of 0, right? The square root of 0 is just 0. And 0 is a perfectly good real number, right? So the answer is 0. Unfortunately, that's not quite right. The answer is not 0. Let's go back up here. Look at the condition, right? This is going to be true if n is even and c is greater than 0. This does not say greater than or equal to 0. C has to be strictly positive, not equal to 0. So what is the answer then? If it's not 0 and it's not, what is this limit? Well, one way to answer that question is let's look at the graph. Okay. And it's going to be a little bit of a sloppy graph here, but bear with me. Four, five, six, seven, seven, eight. All right. So the graph should look something like this. Right. So you have the square root of 1 is 1, the square root of 4 is 2, the square root of 9 is 3. So the graph. Right. Right. So Presumably, you've seen that graph before, right? So here's 1, 2, 3 for x. Here's 1, 2, 3 for y. Right. And now you, should be able to, now you should be able to tell what the answer is here. So we know it's not 0. Oops. There we go. Um, so what is the answer? Well, look at the graph, right? If x is positive, if you're coming from the right side, the y values here seem to be getting close to 0. Now, you might still think it's 0. But remember, limit is from both sides, left and right. What's the limit coming from the left side? What are the y values approaching? Well, there are no y values here, right? There's nothing here. So there is no limit from the left side. And so there's no limit from both sides. This limit does not exist. Okay. So this is why you have to be very careful. Um, remember, the, the instinct is that I want to find the limit just by plugging in x equals 0. But if you do that, you get the wrong answer. You get 0 when it's actually that there is no limit here. Okay. So again, you don't find the limit by plugging in the number. You, you can, but you have to look at these specific conditions here, right? In those cases, you can plug in the number, but not in every case. Okay? Now, again, this is getting, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but if you remember earlier I said that you can take the limit, the right-handed limit, and so here, if we're only considering numbers bigger than 0, when x is bigger than 0, then there's no issue. Then this limit is 0. Okay. But if you try to take the left-handed limit, the limit from the left side, from the negative side of 0, this limit does not exist. Okay. And so going back to this now, Right? When there's no plus or minus up here, it's the limit from both sides. And for that limit to exist, both of these would have to agree. But they don't. They don't match. The limit from the right of the square root function, the square root of x, is 0. But the limit from the left does not exist. And so because these are not equal, this limit does not exist. Okay, so I hope that helps. Okay, next property. Um, f, and, f and g are functions such that the limit as x approaches c, 
right? So this is supposed to be a C here of g of x is equal to L. Now I know that that was different from before, right? Before it was the limit, uh, L was the limit of F, not G. So just, just keep that in mind that this is different now. And the limit as x approaches L, right? Not C here. This is an L now of f of x is f of L. In other words, you can find the limit of the function f just by plugging in the number. Again, that doesn't work always, but it works here. So if that's the case, then here's what we can conclude. You take the limit as x approaches c of f of g of x, right? If you remember, some books write this as f composed with g of x, right? So this is the same thing as f of g of x. Right. So this is composition, right? It's not multiplication. This is function composition. Okay. So according to this property, if, as long as these conditions hold, then you can evaluate the limit of the composition, right, by just plugging in the C, right, into, or, or not plugging in C, I'm sorry. You can, you can plug in the limit into the function F. In other words, the limit as x approaches c of g of x is L, so you can plug that L into the function f. Okay? So I know this is, this is probably very confusing. Right? So this is something you just got to kind of get used to. Um, but I think when we do an example, this will make a little more sense. So let's do an example of this. Okay. So suppose we want to take the limit as x approaches, I'm going to say 2, of the square root of x squared minus 1. Oop, x squared minus 1. Okay. So that's, that's the question. So you might say, well, can't I just plug in 2 here for x? Well, we don't, we don't really know that yet. After all, this is not a polynomial, right? The square root function is not a polynomial, okay? We did have the following, right? That as x approaches c of the square root of x is equal to the square root of c, as long as c is positive, right? And that's the question, is c positive? So if you plug in x equals 0 here, you're, you're going to plug in a negative number for the square root. That's not going to work. But we're not plugging in 0. We're plugging in 2, right? And so 2 squared minus 1, 4 minus 1 is 3. So this should work, right? So according to this, here's what we're going to do. We're going to think about f of x is the outside function. That's just the square root of x. And then g of x will be the inside function. What's under the square root is x squared minus 1. Okay? So by doing that... We're going to we're going to write this function as the following composition here. Oops, make sure I do this right. So yeah, so f of g of x. So f does what? F takes the square root of well of x. In this case, it's taking the square root of what's inside g of x. But what's g of x? G of x is x squared minus one. And that's exactly what this function is. So that's my f of g of x. Here, right? Okay, so we can take f. f is the square root function. So I'm going to take the square root of the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 1. And I realize I didn't need that long of a square root, but that's okay. Right. So now... What do we do inside the square root here? What's the limit of x squared minus 1? Well, x squared minus 1 is a polynomial. It's a binomial. It's two terms. So because it's a polynomial, we can just plug in x equals 2 here. And now, 2 squared is 4, and 4 minus 1 is 3. So we, we get the answer, the square root of 3. So we were able to do this because of this property up here. Because this is a composition of two functions, right? 
the first function, the outside function, is the square root function. And then the inside function is just x squared minus 1. Okay. So yes, effectively, of course, we can just plug in 2 here. It does work. But that's because this rule allows us to do that. It doesn't always work. But because these conditions are satisfied in this property, in this theorem, then it does work in this case. So essentially, all these rules here are telling us when we can plug in the C and when we can't. OK? OK, so let's go on to the next property. Um, and this I just copied right out of my, out of my notes here. Um, so this is the next property, theorem 1.6. It's limits for the trig function. So you remember the trig functions, right? You have sine, cosine, tangent cosecant, secant, and cotangent. And, well, this theorem essentially says that, look, you can plug in, right, in order to find the limit, right, so suppose we want to find the limit. Let's look at an example here. Suppose we want to find the limit as, I'll call it x, x approaches pi over 4 of sine of x. Well, according to this first rule here, this says that I can just plug in C. Right? So in other words, this limit has to be just sine of pi over 4. Right? Pi over 4 being 45 degrees. right? And you should know what the sine of pi over 4 is. right? It's on the front cover of your, of your book. You have the unit circle there. That's something you should remember from your trigonometry days. Okay. Um, yeah, and in, in fact, if you plug this on your calculator, it's going to give you the decimal. I'm not looking for the decimal. I'm looking for the exact value here. The exact value is the square root of 2 over 2. Okay. Now, in your, well, most likely in your pre-calc days, they warned you that you have to rationalize the denominator, right? That in some cases, this might turn out to be 1 over the square root of 2, and they wouldn't accept that. They say, look, you have to rationalize the denominator, multiply top and bottom by square root of 2, and then that just gives you the square root of 2 over the square root of 4, and the square root of 4 being 2. Okay, so I'm mentioning that because, yes, we prefer this, right? If you look at the answer in the book, it'll give you this. It won't give you this answer here. But at this point, I'm not really that picky about it, right? If you have an irrational denominator like this, it's okay with me. It's okay with me. Okay, so I would not mark that wrong. Uh, well, I certainly wouldn't mark it wrong because it is correct. It's just not, it's not, it's an irrational denominator, right? This is not rationalized. So in your algebra days, they always say you have to rationalize the denominator. And as a general rule, you should. But in some cases, it's actually OK to leave it like this. And um, you know, now that we're in calculus, I think, uh, at least in my opinion, it's OK to leave it like this sometimes, as long as you know that these two things are equal, as long as you can go from one to the other. Right, like I did here by using this trick. In any event, right, so, so yeah. So for trig functions, it seems pretty, pretty easy, right, that if you just want to find a limit, you just plug in the, plug in the angle. Right? Suppose we want the limit as, let's say, oh, instead of x, let's use the symbol for angle. I'm going to use theta here. So let's say theta approaches pi of cosine of x. Okay, so this should be easy, right? It's just cosine of pi, and the cosine of pi is negative 1. Right? And that's it. Right. Um, let's do another one. Let's do one for tangents. It's, I don't know if I'll do one for all six of these, but we'll do a few, right? So how about the limit as x approaches pi over 4 again of tangent of x? Okay. 
Well, this is just going to be the tangent of pi over 4, which you should know. It's 1. And that's it. Right? So, yep, in most cases, this is pretty easy. But you have to be careful, right? It doesn't always work. Suppose this is the limit as x goes to pi over 2, and let's use the same tangent function. Well, you might think, hey, look, I, I, until now, we just plug in the numbers, right? So why don't I just plug in pi over 2? OK, well, what's tangent to pi over 2? So you, you might have to think about that a minute, right? But remember, tangent is sine over cosine. And if you look on the unit circle here, right, here's pi over 2. It's at the point zero 0,1. Right? That's your 90 degrees, pi over 2. So sine is the y-coordinate, cosine is the x-coordinate, so this would be 1 over 0. 1 over 0 is not a number, it's undefined. And so there you go, right? Tangent to pi over 2 is undefined, which means that's not the answer. Right? So that did not work. So what is the answer? This limit does not exist. So one way to see that is to look at the graph of the tangent function. And this is something you probably did in pre-calc or trigonometry, whatever you took. So I'm not going to do a lot of these, but remember at pi over 2 and minus pi over 2, the tangent function had a vertical asymptote. So the graph looks something like this. Oops, it shouldn't come back on itself. Let me try that again. There we go. All right, and then the same thing happens here, although I missed a little bit. And it just repeats, right? It just keeps going. Okay, so if that's the graph, if you're approaching pi over 2 from the left side, you're going to positive infinity. But if you approach pi over 2 from the right side, you're going to negative infinity. And since positive infinity and negative infinity are not the same thing, then the limit fails to exist, right? So the answer is not tangent pi over 2. It's not undefined. The limit does not exist. So what went wrong here, right? I thought this theorem said we can do that, right? I thought this theorem said that we can just plug in the C here, right, for tangents. So let's read this carefully, right? Let C be a real number that's in the domain of the given function. Right? What's the domain of the sine function? I hope you know this, right? All real numbers. Right? You can plug in any number for sine or cosine. So that's true for sine or cosine. However, for tangents, it's not all real numbers, is it? Right? x cannot be pi over 2 plus any multiple of pi. It cannot be the odd multiples of pi over 2. Okay, So that's the domain of the tangent function. And that's exactly what went wrong here. Right? Pi over 4, pi over 4 is in the domain of tangent. Right? But pi over 2 is not. Right? It's where you get a vertical asymptote. So that's what went wrong, right? So when, when C is not in the domain, then the limit fails to exist. We can say that for all, all six of these, right? So for sine and cosine, and maybe this is a good review, very quickly, for sine and cosine, right, the domain is all real numbers, negative infinity to positive infinity, right? That's sloppy. Let's try that one more time. So that's a little better. Right, so that's the domain of the sine and cosine function. Oh, you should also know the range. Right, the range is from negative 1 to 1. All right. All right. What about tangents? Well, we already mentioned tangents. And it's also the same domain for secant. So for tangent or for secant of x, the domain is, well, I, it's hard to use interval notation here. So I'm just going to say x is not pi over 2 plus n pi. Okay, 
So it cannot be pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, right? 5 pi over 2, negative pi over 2, and so on. Um, let's not worry about the range here. Um, they're different for tangent and secant. All right, what about cotangent or cosecant? These have the same domain. And in this case, it's a little bit easier. X cannot be any multiple of pi. So it cannot be 0 or pi or 2 pi or 3 pi or 4 pi. Right. So for both of these, right, n is any integer. Right. Or if, if you like, you can write them out, right? n is negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. In both directions. So, sorry about that. Okay, so yeah, any integer for n. Right. So for cotangents, you, right, you can't take the limit, say, of as x approaches pi. So say x is approaching pi. For a cotangent x, this will not have a limit, right? So this will be, does not exist again. Okay, and the same is true. Let's say x is going to 3 pi, and we have cosecant. So 3 pi is a multiple of pi. This limit does not exist. So yeah, you have to be careful. You have to remember the domain and range. Uh, well, mostly the domain for these trig functions here. So that will tell you sort of the exceptions, when the limit will not exist. But for most cases, the limit will exist. Right? Um, so it's maybe let's do one more example, because this could be a little more complicated in some cases. Um, Suppose we want to do the limit as x approaches pi of, let's do the cosecant of x over 3. So what would that be? Right. Now, you might say, wait a minute, x is approaching pi, and this is cosecant, and it cannot be a multiple of pi, so, so maybe this does not exist. Well, except that we're not taking the limit as of cosecant of x, right? This is not cosecant of just x. The angle here is x divided by 3. Okay? So, so yeah, you can take the cosecant of pi divided by 3. So pi over 3 is in the domain of cosecant, right? It's not a multiple of pi, right? So it's not 2 pi or 3 pi, or it's pi over 3, right? So, yeah, so this is going to work here. What's the cosecant of pi over 3? Yeah, I, I don't remember either. I really don't know what it is. But I know that cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. It's 1 over the sine. And I do remember the sine of pi over 3. Right. The sine of pi over 3 is square root of 3 over 2. Okay. But what's the reciprocal of the square root of 3 over 2? Right. It's, well, I'll write it here. It's 2 divided by the square root of 3. So the answer, 2 over square root of 3. However, and again, remember I, I said I'm okay with that. You can write it that way. But just to conform with the way the book would write the answer, let's rationalize the denominator, right? Multiply by root 3 over root 3, so you get 2 square root of 3 over the square root of 9, which is 3. So I would accept either one of these. Just be aware that this is the standard way to write it, right? If you check your answer in the back of the book or on, on, uh, on WebAssign, either way, um, Right? The, the book will have this answer. So if you have this answer here, you might think, oh, I must have got it wrong. No, nope, you didn't get it wrong. You just didn't rationalize the denominator. So again, you should do that. But on a test, um, if I ask for the answer and you write 2 over square root of 3, yep, I'm not, I'm not picky about that. Um, no, most, most likely, you're not, you're not even going to lose a point for that. It's, it's not a big deal. It's just a different way to write the answer. Um, again, I know they did make a big deal about this in your algebra class, 
And the reason they did that is because they want you to do this. They want you to get used to the idea of rationalizing the denominator. Because in most cases, it's a good idea to do that, to write it this way. So this is a good idea to write it this way. Um, right? Because in some cases, you know, depending on, you know, well, it's depending on your professor. Some professors will be very picky and say that they won't, they won't accept this. Right? So right, it's this version of it. Um, but no, I'm not picky about that. A after all, it's, once you get used to this, it's no different than, say, you know, if you write 0 0.8 or 4 over 5, why should I care how you write it? It's the same number either way. So, yeah, for that matter, 2 over square root of 3 or 2 square root of 3 over 3, of course, they're the same. It's the same number. It's just a different way to write it. Okay. Right. On the other hand, um, and maybe, maybe this is you know, getting too far ahead, but obviously you can also write this answer as you know, 16 over 20. Right? So yeah, this is a little more akin to this. 16 over 20 really would not be an acceptable answer because it's not reduced to its lowest terms. Okay? So even, even I, would mark a, I, I, would, I would take a point off for that. If you don't simplify your answers, yeah, that's bad. And a lot of professors would say that this here is not simplified. It's an irrational denominator. So I don't quite go that far. All right, so enough of that, right? So that's the idea here, right? For trig functions, you can generally plug in the C to find the limit, except, of course, when the C is not in the domain of the function. And... So this is getting to be a bit of a long video. This is a long section. So I'm actually going to stop it here, and then we'll continue with part two um, in the next video.